Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Kate Liska um, and today I want to talk a little bit about history and archaeology in the Inland Empire. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research. I direct the Wadi El Houdi expedition to Egypt and this is a very cool place where the ancient Egyptians went and mined amethyst. This is the largest amethyst mine in the entire ancient world. And through the binding of amethyst, we can also look at the importance of jewelry, the importance of the color purple, and um, how the ancient Egyptians actually organized the, their larger expeditions. But I also want to tell you uh, a little bit about archaeology and history in the Indian Empire. If you want to learn more, I really recommend that you go to the Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art on the CSUSB camp. Um, now, whenever the museum's open, you can go and see hundreds of objects from ancient Egypt and learn all about their amazing society. Um, and when the museum happens to be closed, you can visit the museum virtually by using their brand new Matterport. So definitely check it out. Uh, there are many places to go to learn more. Did you ever look at a piece of ancient Egyptian jewelry and wonder, how did they make that? Where did they get that? Well, it's not easy. The acquisition and making of ancient Egyptian jewelry was something that the pharaohs desperately wanted and backed with a lot of resources, a lot of time and a lot of perseverance because of how much it meant to them and to their society. And it wasn't for a practical reason. Amethyst doesn't really have a utilitarian purpose, but rather this jewelry was an object of prestige that they could give out to people. So today we're going to be looking at how the pharaohs did this 4,000 years ago in a series of amethyst mines from Wadi El Houdi. And at the start, these missions seem to be impossible because of the very, very harsh environment that they had to face and the fact that they are incredibly far from the Nile. But was it worth it? I mean, this was pretty hard to do. Now, I want you to put yourself into the mind of the ancient Egyptians a little bit. In ancient Egypt, purple was not normal. Most things were not purple and they didn't even have a word for the color purple. Um, so try to imagine a world just for a minute without any purple in it. Um, most of our purples today actually come from dyes or other synthesized materials. But 4,000 years ago in ancient Egypt, it was not standard. And prior to this time, there are a couple of pieces of amethyst known from the entire ancient Mediterranean world, but it is not a lot by a long shot. So around 2000 BC, when purple uh, and amethyst was discovered at Wadi El Houdi, this changed everything. Um, and they wanted it. And the pharaohs and the courtiers and the officials basically went bonkers to go and gather as much as they could. The finding of Wadi El Houdi really changed jewelry and color spectrum at that time. So during the Middle Kingdom, something like 2000 to 1700 BCE, amethyst became this object of very high status. And the pharaoh acquired it through these massive expeditions into the deserts to quarry the amethyst. And then he essentially doled out these objects of beautiful jewelry to elite individuals, especially princesses and queens. And we see this in a number of tombs from royal individuals and also upper class individuals where amethyst objects have been found. We also know that amethyst is incredibly important because the pharaoh gifted it to gods in temples for use in their festivals. And we can see this in places like the stele of Ikhernofret at Abydos, where he talks about gifting something to gods. This is really important because amethyst is an object of prestige and rareness. So this is the type of thing that gets the pharaoh into the gods goods books as well. But you know, what's so special about amethyst? Is it just pretty and in vogue and that's it? No, 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 no. This is ancient Egypt that we're talking about. Almost everything has a religious meaning as well. So what is it for amethyst? And we can actually see that religious meaning alluded to in Coffin Text 576. And the title of this spell is, as for any man who knows this spell, he shall have sex in the land by night or by day, and he will have the heart of the woman beneath him when he has sex. The content of the spell basically goes on to describe essentially what's in the title, and then it gives instructions on how to perform it. The instructions are to be recited over a bead of carnelian or of amethyst and to be placed in the right arm of the deceased. So based on this spell, we assume that amethyst is sexy or it can get you sex. 
And that even happens when you're dead, which also might allude to why a lot of amethyst is found in tombs as well. It's for their use in the afterlife. So how in the world did all of this happen? How did the pharaohs find that amethyst? Well, it all started about 4,000 years ago when ancient prospectors were walking around Wadi El Hudi and they saw natural outcrops like this one of milky white quartz. Then the prospectors would essentially dig starter mines like this one that are basically small holes that dot the Wadi El Hudi landscape where these prospectors would go and look for the larger vein. Melky quartz and amethyst are essentially the same stone. Amethyst is essentially purple quartz, so they'd follow the white to see if they could find purple. And when they found a large enough vein, that's when they would tell other people about it. So when substantial veins of amethyst were found at Wadi El Hudi, the world was changed. This new red, arid, rocky, almost Martian-like landscape was now on the radar of the ancient Egyptians and it became an incredibly important place. This region of Wadi El Hudi is probably about 100 square kilometers in size and it's about 35 kilometers away from Aswan. Aswan, even though it is a current city, was also very important in the ancient world and it had an important role in Wadi El Hudi's administration because it helped to supply the missions there too. So we currently know of about 41 archaeological sites in this larger zone known as Wadi El Hudi, and three of them are these colossal ancient Middle Kingdom amethyst mines, where the mines are basically the size of football fields. And each of these mines have very large settlements next to them where the people would live to actually assist in the mining. And workers on these expeditions would leave inscriptions all over the rocks at Wadi El Hudi. And these inscriptions really do inform us about what is going on out in the desert. So sometimes they give us these long detailed explanations of day by day people and work. And other times they're individual people's names or images or even drawings of their sandals. So far we know of about 280 inscriptions, uh, but every single time we go into the desert, we find new ones that expand our knowledge. But these expeditions were not easy to do. They were actually full of a lot of different types of hardships. So how in the world did the Egyptians do it? Well, first the pharaoh would pick one of his high officials and put that official in charge. I mean, the pharaoh didn't go himself, of course not. Um, and then that official would go and be in charge of the entire expedition. And he was the one that was responsible for either its success or his failure. And we know this because in a lot of inscriptions, they actually tell us why they went out there. They went out, quote, to fetch the amethyst for the king. But this wasn't necessarily a bad job to be assigned to either. A lot of these officials took pride in actually going to Wadi El Hudi and finding the amethyst of the king. And we know this because of the inscriptions that they left all over the site. We have dozens of inscriptions of individual officials talking about how proud they are of these types of expeditions. And they would put these specific of uh, inscriptions around the site so that they were there for history, so that they were there for bragging rights. And very often they would put these inscriptions upon the thoroughfares of where a lot of the workers would actually walk, whether it was uh, to and from where they lived to where they worked or in other locations of heavy traffic, so that the inscriptions also bragged about the officials and the ones with the names of the Pharaoh on it acted as projections of authority. So when the pharaoh would order an expedition, they would go and they would get the amethyst. But these expeditions were effectively temporary and infrequent. Uh, and we're tr still trying to sort out how long an expedition would actually have taken place, whether it was a couple of months or maybe even a full year, as one particular inscription tells us. Um, we also don't know when during the year these expeditions actually took place. Now, I would tell you that you should go sometime between November and March when the weather is a lot cooler and it only gets to 100 degrees by, you know, like two in the afternoon. Um, 
but that's might be my modern sensibility speaking they could have gone at any time of the year but when you go at other points of time there are other hardships as well so for instance in may 2014 our team had the uh, fortune of being out there in may and not only was it extraordinarily hot but on one day when there was no wind at all sand flies basically arose out of the desert and ate us alive uh, it is a really harsh environment. Now inscriptions tell us a lot about who actually went out to Wadi El Houthi to do this work and they can tell us that up to 1500 people were part of one expedition and normally historians are like oh yeah well 1500 people went out to Wadi El Houthi but as an archaeologist you need to look at the individual settlements and say does 1500 people actually work here? And I will tell you that no, no, it doesn't. 1,500 people cannot fit into Site 9 or Site 5 or Site 4 or even any of the other locations. So how in the world does this number actually work? Archaeology needs to balance and explain and bring to life what we see in these inscriptions. Well, I don't think the number is fallacious. My idea is that this 1,500 might actually represent all of the people that were part of the expedition during their entire duration. So for instance, we have workers, we have officials, we have policemen, all of whom need to be accounted for. We also have multiple archeological sites that we're pretty sure were used at the same time. So maybe they actually opened up sites five and nine simultaneously. And in addition to that, you also have to supply these missions. So all told, perhaps we can actually get to the number 1500. Now, a large part of that 1500 person number might also be the caravans that were required to supply these settlements frequently perhaps even daily so that the people there don't die. We're not really sure, but it was regular, right? Um, and it would have been a massive donkey caravan bringing them things like food and water and other supplies and taking things back to the Nile Valley too. Uh, on the other side, Aswan would have been a major place where these caravans would have been supplied also. And we learn about these caravans actually from the inscriptions, but also from other archeological evidence too. Animal bones also support the idea of these regular caravans of donkeys from Aswan because we see that a major staple of the workers' diets was actually fish and sheep, neither of which are actually found in the desert and would have had to have been brought to them. We also have a lot of gazelle bones demonstrating that they were also hunting in the desert to supplement their diet of things brought from the Nile. Now, these ancient caravans probably also had to supply all of these people at these larger mines with water, too. Despite the fact that we've looked for it, we can't actually find any wells near the areas of large settlement and large mining activity. Now, there might be a well out at Site 8. Um, we're not positive yet, but that's still a good five kilometers or four kilometers away from the main areas of mining. So these caravans might have been trekking in water, you know, five kilometers, that's a long way. And if Site 8 isn't actually a well, we're not sure yet, were they actually bringing water the entire way in from the Nile? That seems a bit extreme, but at the same time, if you really want amethyst, you will go to the extremes to make it happen. Water is clearly the most precious commodity out in the desert. And at Wadi El Houthi, we actually see a lot of evidence of the administration controlling water more than almost anything else. There's specific water depots where they have segregated the water. There are administratively protected areas that normal people can't really get into without crossing past where soldiers would sit. Um, and that is also where you find a lot of broken water jars. The administration seems to have been hoarding the water and rationing it as they would need to if it was actually being brought in a substantial distance. 
In addition to the laborers and the administrators, we also have a lot of evidence of police or soldiers out at Wadi El Hudi too. This would have been a large part of their force. And it was their job essentially to sit on mountaintops or on the tops of rock pinnacles to essentially watch the surrounding landscape for something and to be aware of things. And the largest soldier lookout is actually at the very pinnacle of Site 6 that you see in the lower left-hand corner. From this point, you can see the full area of Site 5, of Site 9, the road back to Aswan, and most of the road that leads to Site 4 as well. It was a great place to watch the surrounding area. But the soldiers sitting at the top probably would have been bored with, you know, hey, Look out in the desert and tell me what's happening. And so in their sheer boredom, they actually spent their time drawing a lot of pictures of soldiers on the rocks at the top of Site 6 too. And these are very endearing. There are some hundred inscriptions at Site 6 um, that all reflect this soldiering class. Sometimes you have their names, their titles, their images, um, or just sometimes their sandals or lines. Now, our soldiers are not the first people to ever draw inscriptions out at Site 6 either. They were probably inspired by a group of pastoral nomads who had been there a thousand years earlier, around 3000 BCE. And they had drawn a number of things like, you know, oxen and cow and cattle and other things. Um, the environment had since changed since 5,000 years ago to 4,000 years ago. So despite the fact that we've looked for them, we haven't been able to find any contemporary evidence of pastoral nomads. But 5,000 years ago, they did draw these inscriptions. And then 4,000 years ago, our soldiers showed up at this hilltop and they were inspired because graffiti begets other graffiti, and so they too drew their soldiering inscriptions next to them. But they also endearingly integrated themselves into the earlier images too. So for instance, here you can actually see our 4,000 year old soldier with his staff, but he is actively spearing a, uh, an animal that was created a thousand years before him. And this isn't the only one either. Uh, in this particular image, you see a 5,000-year-old sheep and some 5,000-year-old people. Um, but over on the left-hand side, you see one of our soldiers with a feather in his hat. He has an axe in his right hand, and he's grabbing the sheep by its tail so that he can smite the sheep as well. So a lot of fun how these soldiers interact with their natural environments. But the presence of all of these soldiers also begs the question, why do you need them? What is their job really out there in the desert to do? I mean, you're 35 kilometers into the desert. There's absolutely no way that there's going to be some giant Nubian army marching up to attack you and steal what you're taking. So that's kind of out of the question. So what's their point? Are they there to protect from bands of pastoral nomads that actually might try to attack the settlement? Maybe, but we've looked for pastoral nomads and so far we have not found any contemporary interactions with them, although we are still always checking. Maybe they're protecting from attacking animals. That's a possibility, you are out in the desert, um, but at the same time, they're sitting way on the tops of hills. So even if they saw some, you know, giant attacking animal out in the desert, there's no way they could actually like run down the hill or sound out a call fast enough to protect people. So what are they doing? Perhaps they're actually not protecting the workers, but rather um, watching the workers. So we actually have an active debate among the team at Wadi El Hudi, and we don't know if we are working in a place where the laborers are paid well and they're skilled and they're happy to be there and everybody's working together and for them, or if we're actually looking at a prison labor camp with people who are unhappy to be there. And if it's the latter, then perhaps the soldiers are there to actually make sure that these guys out in the desert don't, you know, run away. <laughs> Now, we also know that the laborers at Wadi El Hudi were both Egyptian and sometimes they were Nubian. And we see this in an inscription like this one, WH143, also known as the Stele of Horus. At the bottom it says, 
as for every Ewan Bowman of Ta Seti, that's a type of Nubian who was brought out to Wadi al-Hudi, his work as a slave is only done because of the terror inspired by this god. It refers to the King Sinwazrit I at the time. And so the argument looking at this type of stele is that the people working out there, especially Nubians, were brought in as a prison labor force, perhaps. However, we also have contradictory evidence, too. So, for instance, this one, Wadi al Hudi IV, which was from the reign of Mantu Hotep IV a little earlier, it also talks about Nubians coming out to Wadi al Hudi. Here it says, All the Nehezi, meaning Nubians of Wawa, Taseti, and the northern and southern parts, basically came out to work. Here they are just integrated into the standard force and not necessarily there because of the terror of the king. So it is a very different type of literary take at these inscriptions. So there were both Nubian and Egyptian laborers out at Wadi al Hudi, but we also have soldiers and we have administrators. And we can see through the archaeology that there are three major types of areas in the settlements. First, there seem to be these housing areas. There are also sometimes places for storage areas that the administrators controlled. And then there are these larger buildings that are more protected for the use of the administration. Um, in particular, we're looking at site nine here where we have two very large buildings known as Area A. And this area was likely controlled by the administration and also a place where they stored and protected some of their most precious commodities. In fact, one particular room in Area A looks to be perhaps the most protected room of the entire site. And we can tell that because it's way in the back. It's pretty hard to get to with all of these twists and turns. And the walls are actually thicker here than in the rest of the building. Plus, somebody went to the great agony of plugging every single space within these walls with tiny little holes so that nobody could actually see through either. So whatever was in this room was very, very important to what they were doing at Wadi El Hudi. Now we also know that the construction of these large settlements would not have taken place until the administrators knew that they were going to be working on a very large vein of amethyst, meaning that they were going to be working in one location for an incredibly long time. And after the mine was actually already started. And we know this because if you look at the construction of the walls, you can see two different stones being used inter interchangeably. You have this lighter pink granitoid bedrock that comes directly as spoil from the digging of the mine. And then you have these darker stones too that are found on the surface. So they're basically grabbing from both piles when they're building their buildings. And as you can imagine, the mines of sites four, five, and nine, that is our biggest ones with these football field sized mines, have a lot of evidence as to how the mining process actually took place. So we can see the spoil heaps directly on either side of the mine as they dug it out, they left their dirt there. And then when you travel down to either end of the edges of the spoil heap, you have these large open flatter areas that seem to be some sort of sorting or workspace Space. And in those spaces, we get a lot of broken amethyst crystals. So they seem to be taking out chunks of stone and hitting them in these locations and, and basically paring down the stone into the sections that they want. We also have a lot of hammer stones found in these zones too. And they use lots of different types of tools. I mean, we have multiple styles of hammer stones. So for instance, some very large ones might have been hafted onto a piece of wood and treated more like a pick or a shovel in some capacity. Um, individualized sized ones would have been used as two handed pounders and even small ones could be put into your individual hand to knock out and do some finer work around the edges to try to break free the actual granite from the crystal and the amethyst that you wanted inside. 
So after these large chunks of stone are broadly refined next to the mine itself, the stone then goes in for further refinement. And you can see that small blue hole at the front of site five, that is basically right where the mine meets the site itself. And inside that walled zone, you can see the evidence of further refinement of the larger pieces of stone. They're trying to get it down to its small piece of amethyst so that they don't carry it home. But interestingly, as they do these further levels of refinement, it comes with more protection from the administration. So after that particular room, we then see that you travel up the hill of Site 5 into these areas of the inner enclosure wall that seem to be just this administrative zone that is highly protective. This zone is protected by guard posts and it's protected by a boulder gateway. There's only two ways in and out. So the administrative administration definitely controlled it. And within one of the most protected rooms of this area, that's where you see evidence of even further refinement. They carried this stuff up a hill to break it down even more and so that the administration could watch over it with further refinement and further refinement and further refinement. It really begs the question, how much amethyst did they actually get from Wadi El Houdi? Well, WH4 actually gives us a little bit of information about that. It says that over the course of the entire expedition that they gathered 150 hecat, which is approximately equal to about 680 liters of amethyst for one campaign. That's actually quite a lot. Um, and it really did help to supply jewelry. So they would take these raw amethyst back to various types of craftsmen in the Nile Valley. Some raw amethyst has been found in a craft workshop both in Aswan and up in the capital near Lisht. Um, so it was transported all across the country because of how important it was and then it was turned into stunning jewelry at that time. So thank you so much for listening and I also want to thank my entire amazing team that works out at Wadi El Houdi with me. This is in no way my work alone, it is the work of so many other people and we have been working to study, to record, and to map this area. We're also making very cool 3D models of Wadi El Houdi so hopefully you too will be able to virtually visit the archaeological sites. We hope that you enjoyed this video and to learn more definitely check out our website Wadi El hoodie.com and please consider supporting us with a donation for the project. It would go a very long way um, and hopefully there'll be more videos soon too. So thanks for listening.